Thanks.
right, so the time approaches. Who are my wonderful students today? Good. We have a little bit lighter attendance than normal. Oh, that's all right. Let's see. All right. About oops. I can't tell. Oh no, we got a ton of people. We had a ton of people today. Wonderful. Oh my gosh, you guys are great. The best class ever. Cheers. This is my ginormous cup of coffee. Cheers. I gotta adjust my thing in between here. Cheers. So today I would like to talk about experimental error. And um, uh, let's see, um, blah, 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 sig figs, type, da, 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 da. So I've done this a billion times. So forgive me if I'm like a little bit scattered because I might jump off on a tangent and come back. But I promise if you hang in there, everything will come together. So um, there's always like a, um, uh, oh, oh, first of all, I want to make you a promise, right? This is how you're supposed to start my paper, I promise. I promise that you'll have a much better grasp on how to quantitatively deal with uh, uncertainty and errors in experiments when you're done with these lectures, okay? So why do we care about uncertainty? Well, um, uh, in this case, um, you guys may remember the Zika epidemic, where if uh, women, pregnant women, got this um, mosquito-borne Zika, Zika virus, it could lead to microencephaly, which is a pretty, I mean, to me, a kind of a graphically horrifying disease where the babies have basically no big part of their brain, you know, and their heads are flat and everything, and they're just kind of like sort of vegetated, you know. I mean, who knows, but yikes. Anyway, so... Um, uh, so in this case, um, it was, there were, uh, uh, there were technicians at a Washington DC lab. Gosh, my, my niece may be working there. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> she works at, she works in Seattle and she's a, a clinical lab scientist. And so it's like, oh my God. this could totally be what she does, you know? And, um, they got a bunch of these Zika tests and they all came back negative. But it turns out they just mis misdiluted some reagent and you know, they botched it basically. You know? So that's like, ah, that's a high pressure job. Jeez, poor girl. Anyway, so um, uh, that's an example of where everything went wrong, you know. Um, but if you look at between the 40s, the 80s, and you know, who knows now, whatever. Um, uh, about 10% error rate was typical in the 40s for, for chemical tests. You know? And these are just right, wrong answers, but you know, whatever. And then uh, by the 80s, that was down to, let's see, 0.05%, right? That is really low. You know, who knows what it'll be in the future? It's probably, it'll vary a lot depending on the, on the particular task. Uh, to, uh, to, to be muting folks here. So, um, so uh, errors start in our, in our course with significant figures, right? And so let's just go ahead and plod through this a little bit. Um, so uh, significant figures or sig figs, right? So let's see here. We'll make that one of these. Okay. Oops. 
F I G is C figs. <laughs> um, basically, uh, this is all about how not to lie when you're uh, when you're talking about um, uh, scientific reporting. So, um, if you if you have a value that you're reporting, like for example, you're you know whatever nine point two five times ten to the fourth, right? This is actually um, you know uh, ninety two thousand five hundred, right? But you might write it as nine point two five times ten to the fourth because. Uh, I'll tell you about the midterm. The midterm is, uh, don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll bring that up. Uh, it's gonna be like a, a week from next Thursday. Okay, so uh, 9.25 times to the fourth, right? And the question is, do you know that it's 9.25 zero or might it be 9.253 or 9.251 or nine or something like that, right? And so, um, so in this example, uh, this number is called three significant figures because we have the nine, the two and the five, they're all significant, right? The leading zeros are not significant, you know, um, they're kind of like known zeros and they're not part of the number. The trailing zeros are significant most of the time. Right? So um, 9.25 times 10 to the fourth here is a three sig fig number, right? So that means the uncertainty begins in the five. You know, it could be in the five or it could be the next digit over, right? But um, we're definitely, um, not, we're definitely saying that we don't know about the um, this next digit, like what it is, if it's a one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. Right? Now, if we write the zero here in this format, you know, in exponential numbers, 9.250 times to the fourth, we are implying that we know this value to be zero. It's, and same with this, 9.250. Zero, zero times over the four. That's a five significant figure number, right? And um, so the zeros are significant in the middle of the number, obviously, or at the number to the right of the decimal point. You know, these are, this is always true. If the number is to the right of the decimal point, then, then it's, um, or if the zero is to the right of the decimal point, it's significant. Or if it's, a, you know, um, obviously, a number other than zero to the right is significant, but the zero to the right of the decimal point is always significant. So, that is pretty boring, but let's go ahead and keep going here. Um, so, uncertainty in measured quantities. So, this is one thing to get um, through our little heads pretty early is that there is uncertainty in any measured quantity. Right? Anything that you, you know, have to, you know, like as, a co as opposed to counting, you know, like we could say there's two people in the room. We don't consider there to be any uncertainty in, the room, in, in that type of number in terms of counting them. Uh, but, uh, what else is Oh, we should have connected audio. Sorry, I'm all over the place. I apologize. Um, so, um, any measured quantity will have uncertainty, and um, uh, if it, if you have an instrument with a digital readout, like the where none of the digits fluctuate. Right? None of the digits sort of change over time, right? That basically means that whoever built the instrument truncated the number. 
to a value that is too conservative, you know, for the um, for the scientific application of that meter, you know. But, I mean, it's not that it doesn't happen, you know. But if you want, if you want every bit of precision that you can get, you have to expect the last digit to fluctuate a bit, right? <clears throat> so. Um, you know, this is getting less and less relevant, you know, because digital readouts are so common nowadays. You know, it used to be that, you know, there was a, actually in volumetric stuff, there's a, typically a scale. And you have to read between the lines. <laughs> That's called interpolation, you know. And then the rounding of numbers where you're like, you know, your calculator, if you divide something, it can give you a zillion digits, you know. Then, um, you round only at the last step. You kind of keep all those, you know, insignificant digits until the end, and then at the end you round them off. So this is these are a couple of rules for um, dealing with uncertainty. Okay? So let's deal with sig figs and arithmetic. Arithmetic is pluses and minuses and multiplies. Okay? So um, so uh, let's. Let's follow these three rules. Express all numbers with the same exponent. And I think that's aligning them with the decimal point, right? And then round the numbers according to the uh, number with the fewest decimal places, right? So um, if you've got this, uh, I mean, it's, it seems a little bit artificial, but just kind of go with me for a second and you'll see the point. Uh, 1.632 times 10 to the 5 plus 4.107 times 10 to the 3 and 0 0.984 times 10 to the 6. You know? So well, what is all this stuff? But basically, um, what this means is that if you take all these to the fifth power up here, right? And what you're going to do is you're going to take this 4.107 and see, this is 4,000, right? If you move the decimal to the left, you make this part smaller, so you make this part bigger, right? So it's one, that's to the fourth, and two, right? This to the fifth there, right? So this, is, this number becomes 0 0.04 times 10 to the fifth, right? This guy is 10 to the sixth, right? So this is 900,000, right? So if you move this decimal to the right, you make this smaller by one. So this is 9.84 times 10 to the five, right? So now when you, now what you've done here is you've aligned the decimal points. The decimal points are all basically right here, right? So you can you can start your addition, right? You can do your stupid addition, right? There's nothing here to add to the seven, so the seven comes down, but you add to the zero, so here it comes down. This two plus one is three, so three comes down. When you start it in earnest, and you've got, you know, three plus four is seven, plus four is 11, blah, 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 and then you keep adding these up, you get 11.51307. But the trouble is that you don't know what these digits are. It's 9.84, uh, don't know, don't know, don't know, you know? So you, when you report that number, you can't take seven plus don't know equals seven. That doesn't work, that's not true, you know? Seven plus don't know is don't know, right? Seven plus nine or seven plus one or seven plus zero, we just don't know. <laughs> So, um, so the proper significant figures for this answer is 11.51, right? Times 10 to the five. So it's kind of a stupid example because it's all just numbers. It's like, ah, if I'm going to sleep, but hang in there for this part, right? Now, um, uh, krypton difluoride here. Sorry, it's krypton difluoride anyways. 
I don't know if it even exists, but um, they chose Krypton because they only know the, the formula way to five digits, right? But fluorine, they know God. This is like three, six, nine, ten, eleven digits. Oh my God, that is crazy precise, you know? So when you add up the formula weight or the molecular weight of krypton difluoride here, you get all these digits out here. But because the krypton mass is so uncertain, you can't report these other digits, right? You just, you just don't know what we're adding this to here. So in this case, the least precise value limits the uh, precision of the answer. So um, does this all make sense? Somebody help me out here. I know when you talk to a group of 50 people and you say somebody, and nobody's going to answer. But Alvin's going to answer. Come on, Alvin. Does this make sense? Oh, I didn't hear anything. But can, you, can you hear me? I can hear you now. I can hear you now. Yep, got to practice more, but it does. Okay, okay, it makes sense. It makes sense, right? Because you can't, you can't add, I don't know, to a number, right? And, and get a number. That's all this means, you know. And these ones to the left, for some reason, they don't, they don't even count, right? I guess they're always zeros, right? So, um, so, uh, so if you add numbers, right? You can you can go from four. To or you can increase the number of say pigs, right? Because five plus six is 11, you know, add some other stuff, that's 12. We absolutely know this is true, right? Because these are the most, you know, these are the most significant digits in the number, right? And then if these are all significant, then we got four plus four equals five, right? But then if we subtract numbers, we can lose sig pigs, right? It's like saying, you know, um, uh, it's like weighing by difference. If you have a, um, say, a one milligram balance, and you've got, you know, a thousand milligrams minus 999 milligrams, the difference is almost one milligram. And that's all you know. You just know that it's one. You don't know if it's 1.1 or 1.7 or, you know. So, so you can you can reduce sig figs by subtraction, right? Yay! I get it, Dr. T. You're amazing. Okay. So, um, so multiplication and division. Uh, uh, you know, the rule here is just keep the the, the fewest sig figs, right? So if you've got three point two six nine one point seven eight, this is always you know. Uh, this is three, this is three, so the answer has three, right? This is one, two, three, four, five sig figs times two sig figs equals two, right? Because five plus two, you just take the lesser of the two, keep that number that's there, and then whatever the exponent doesn't even matter here, you just process the exponent, but it doesn't count in the sig figs, right? It's kind of strange. Anyway, so 34.6 divided by this massive number, uh, 34.60 rather, gives four sig figs in the answer. So this is you know, three times three equals three, five times three equals two, four divided by uh, six equals four here, right? In terms of sig figs. Is that 80? So, um, now, if we want to take logs, anti-logs, uh, things get a little bit tricky out here. So, um, in uh, in chemistry, uh, logs and uh, anti-logs are um, helpful because um, we we do this thing called measuring pH. We can also measure things like PCL, P whatever, right? The P there indicates the power of 10. Right? That's what the P was for. 
<clears throat> so like, um, if you measure the pH of a solution, it's, it's not uncommon, I think it's a basic solution for the, for the hydrogen ion concentration to be ridiculously low. It's never zero, but it's ridiculously low. <clears throat> so if you have a pH 14 solution, the hydrogen ion concentration is 10 to the minus 15. That's 0 0.0000000000001. Right? <clears throat> then you can take that from a comparatively acidic solution and the say a pH of zero and the pH and the hydrogen ion concentration will be one. pH of one, it'll be 0.1, right? So we measure pH and these other p values using this logarithmic scale. And that, um, so, so the log of a value is kind of a, use the base 10 log, this is L-O-G, right? Uh, <clears throat> uh, then, uh, basically you have this formula here that um, the log of the value, well, this is weird confusing stuff. Um, um, by the way, this is always true, right? Let's just go ahead and break it down in terms of mantissa and characteristic here. So, if you take the log of a value, you get a number to the left of the decimal point and a number to the right of the decimal point. Okay? Number, the part of the number to the left of the decimal point is called the characteristic. Okay? This roughly means that um, 339 is, is in the, has, its value is in the hundreds, 10 to the two, right? It's a little more than 10 to the, 10 to the two is 100, right? 10 to the two and a half, here's 339, right? But that's how you sort of separate these guys out, right? So when you take the log of the number, the part of the number that falls to the left of this decimal point does not count as a significant difference. Isn't that weird? It doesn't count, right? So the, the 530 here is needed to produce the full 339, right? It's 5, 0.530 times 10 to the, or something like that, times 10 to the 2, right? And then, um, so similarly, if you have a three sig fig number, and you take the log of it, there's a three sig fig number, you take the log of it, you get three digits to the right. Three sig figs, you get three digits to the right. You don't count the characteristic, you don't count the part, it essentially just sets the position of the decimal. Does that make sense? Doesn't make sense to me, but that's something you're gonna have to memorize or be smarter than me and figure out. Okay? So um, <clears throat> that means that if you um, if you can take the log, sometimes you have to take the anti-log, which means raising ten to that power, right? So um, let's say you want to take the anti-log of three point or minus three point four two, right? Well, it turns out that the minus three here is not going to be significant in the answer, right? It's gonna go into the exponent here. So this guy, when you take the anti-log, you only count the digits to the right of the decimal point in the sig figs of the answer. These are the sig figs of the answer right there. So 10 to the 6.142 is a three sig fig answer. Then this is the scale, like the magnitude of the number, 10 to the sixth, yeah. But basically these values here are the 
the precision, the internal precision of the number is, this, is what the sig figs are. So it's kind of strange stuff, but um, but logs and anti-logs, uh, you have to remember this rule. So um, now let's let's keep moving forward and let's talk about types of error. We're going to come back to sig figs, but right now let's keep moving forward. <clears throat> um, every measurement <clears throat> has some uncertainty, right? <clears throat> okay, hold on. I'm going to answer a, a note on chat here. <clears throat> it's about when the midterm. Um, and the answer is, I don't know yet. Probably in two weeks. And it will be by, um, by um, uh, respondus. You stupid lockdown browser. <clears throat> okay, so types of error. Um, basically, there's three types of experimental error or uncertainty or whatever you want to call it, right? <clears throat> there's systematic, random, and then gross. Uh, gross means blunder. And um, uh, so uh, systematic error is also called determinant error. It's also called accuracy error. Right. <clears throat> so I'm going to add here accuracy error. Right. And <clears throat> it arises uh, from a flaw in the equipment or the design, or possibly from a standard, something like that. Right? right. If there's a standard that's that's not what it says it is. You know? <clears throat> and so if you, the systematic part of the error, the accuracy part of the error, if you reproduce the experiment in the same way, <clears throat> it will come back in uh, exactly the same way, right? So, um, uh, so it will basically, you'll reproduce that part of the experimental error, right? And, and in theory, you can correct for it, right? You can say, oh, geez, this experiment all is always 10% too high, you know? So you can basically, if you do it the exact same way, you can take 10% off the, the result and get a more accurate answer. <clears throat> so, um, so the way that you detect it is kind of important, right? <clears throat> and this is, uh, these are these are slightly fuzzy answers, and I like to specify that because there are um, because when I started teaching analytical chemistry, um, I looked at this accuracy problem. I got all twisted up, right? Because I thought, oh, it's not perfectly analytically whatever, you know. But the accuracy part is um, <clears throat> it is fuzzy. So um, that being said, <clears throat> if, you, um, if you use your method and you analyze a, a certified a standard reference material, then <clears throat> you, you know what the answer should be, right? Like if you, if you spend the money and you buy a you know, $500 candy bar that has, you know, uh, 374.2 milligrams of caffeine, and you come out with, you know, 258.3, you know that your method is low. It's giving a low answer, right? 
<clears throat> you know, if you if you do your experiment over a few times, you get 258.3 plus or minus 0.5, right? You know your answer is way far away from the known value. <clears throat> so that's an example of a systematic error. <clears throat> systematic or determinant or accuracy error. Okay? So you can you can analyze the uh, standard reference material. You can, you can send it off to a different lab. Um, you can, you know, basically a variation on different labs and round robin. And um, you, you also, I mean, normally you always measure a blank too. So <clears throat> you of course measure a blank and you kind of should have a non-zero result, right? <clears throat> and the ways to correct it <clears throat> are, you know, you can either just apply the correction factor which is kind of like the least preferable one, you know? But you can also calibrate your glassware and your instruments. This is, calibration is important. And we're actually not gonna to touch on that just yet, but um, calibration is super good way to do things, you know? So if your glassware is not correct, then it can make your answer systematically high or low. If your instrument is reading high or low, it can change your answer, right? Or you can use a method called standard additions and, or, or uh, internal standards, right? Or both, actually. You can use both of these at the same experiment. Um, so, um, and these are, these will go over these in uh, chapter five, I guess. So, you know, whatever. You basically just change the way you make your calibration. So, um, so that's systematic error. Now, random error is, um, uh, it's, it's a part of the error that's always present. I, random error is what I would call uncertainty. You know? it's, um, it has to, it's like a fundamental part of the measurement. You know, and everybody's heard of the uncertainty principle. Well, you know, that's like the, the <laughs> kind of like the limit in the lowest amount of uncertainty you have in an answer. But, um, uh, the uncertainty, excuse me, in a um, in a measured value, um, it's just the normal fluctuation that you expect if you do something carefully over and over. Right? So um, uh, you can never completely eliminate it, right? Because as you go, every time you add a decimal point. If you answer, there's always a little uncertainty on the end. On the next doesn't right? so you can't completely eliminate it. You know? um, so it can be uh, hopefully it has an equal chance of being positive or negative. You know, that's that's important. You know? When you're when you're when you're next to zero, then sometimes this doesn't work, you know, and it's like kind of strange. You know, well, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, it's always present and you can, you can generally try to reduce it, you know? Um, you know, and it could be a scale, it could be an instrument error. There's, you know, there's probably a myriad ways in which uh, you can get random error in your, in your, in your, your result, okay? So, and then the last one is gross error, and that's basically just screwing things up. It's very common, it's very okay, that's why we're students. So don't worry about gross errors in the lab anyway. They're gonna happen. So you just, you know, you just, uh, you know, record them in your lab notebook. And then, um, you know, then uh, you can consult or whatever to see whether you have to redo an experiment or not, right? You know, you can calculate it, calculation error. You can overshoot an endpoint in a titration. You can, uh, you know, you can drop your sample, your instrument can shut down, whatever. You know, these, are, these are gross errors. So you can't really find it necessarily. Okay. So now, um, certified reference materials are, uh, there. this is sort of the origin of all, of all analytical chemistry, basically. You know, we, have, we have a temple or something somewhere where, um, People make these uh, certified reference materials, and um, uh, uh, 
they also code standard reference materials. And they're just, they're just, you know, things with known amounts of other things, with known amounts of your analyte in them. It's your analyte that you're analyzing for, you know. And so, um, uh, as an example, uh, people who take uh, anticonvulsants for epilepsy, you know, this uh, neurological disorder where you, you can have uh, seizures, uh, the anticonvulsants are real important. You know, you got to have them so you don't have a seizure and hurt yourself. But then, if the anticonvulsants are at a level that's too high, then they're toxic. Right? So this is like the classic, you know, case where the answer you get has to be accurate and precise. Right? So. Um, uh, So certified a certified reference material for this anticonvulsant would be blood, right? So, hold on. so uh, what you would do is you would purchase blood that is known to have a certain amount of uh, uh, either fentoin or phenobarbital or whatever these guys is, you know? And, and then you would and you put them through your whole analysis, right? And you would get an answer and you can replicate that answer. So you'll get an answer at an uncertainty interval, right? And if everything's going properly, then that answer should be converging on some single average. And then, so, um, uh, so once you get this answer with its error interval, right? <laughs> then you can compare that to the known value. And the known value will have a, a smaller error interval with it, right? You can say, well, are these numbers really different in such a way that the error intervals do not overlap. Right? So you can say, well, you know, if if your answer gives a five percent uncertainty and the standard reference has a one percent uncertainty, but they differ by thirty percent, then you know that that difference is really significant, right? So you can say, wow, you know, my instrument. My method reads 30% too high. There's no other way to know that than with a standard reference material. And so the standard or the certified reference material is like the, the basis of all, you know, everything we do. It's like you can never get an answer better than your reference material. So basically, I don't know. It, it, you know, you can you can create your own if you needed to, you know, but it's just that um, uh, it's 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 a little bit tricky. So, um, so anyway, that's how we that's how we would do that. Is that um, we use a standard reference material to get our accuracy and precision. <clears throat> then these are more def definitions of precision and accuracy. If, if several measurements agree, then your, your method is precise. If several measures vary widely, then your method is not precise. Uncertainty is defined as the precision. Yeah, it's kind of like, what the hell is this? You know? Uncertainty is it's basically that's that precision. Yeah. And the accuracy is how close this the value, the, like a measure value, an average. Is to the true value. You know? And you know, um, So the reproducibility of a result, right, doesn't tell you how accurate it is, you know? 
It just tells you how precise it is. I don't know, it can kind of go around forever on this stuff. I tend to do that. So I'm going to move forward, yeah. <clears throat> so um, the absolute uncertainty has the unit of the answer, right? So you're at reading of 12.35 plus 0.02 means that the true value could be between 12.33 and 12.37, right? But our best guess is that it's 12.35, right? Now, the relative uncertainty is a unit less value, and it's normally expressed, expressed in percent, right? So um, in this case, 0.02 over 12.35, the relative uncertainty is 0 0.002, which is 0.2%. Ah, I'm back. I don't know what happened. Oh, shoot. So um, I hope everybody can still hear me and everything. But um, so, uh, gosh, what I was saying is that <clears throat> absolute relative uncertainty are important absolute has the unit of the answer relative has no units or basically percent of the answer right <clears throat> then um okay this is just a stupid summary of stuff that doesn't really matter right so now let's talk a little bit about propagation of uncertainty right so <clears throat> um this is a a wonderful fun topic for teachers. And it is an enormously frustrating topic for students. <clears throat> so it's one where we love to torture you. Because once you kind of get it, it's super easy. Uh -huh. But until you get it, it is super hard, super frustrating, and super what the F are we doing? So, <clears throat> Um, propagation of uncertainty is where you have two uncertain values and you put them together in some way, with some formula. You can add them or subtract them or multiply them or divide them or, you know, uh, I don't know, whatever. You can just do things, to, you know, exponentiate one with the other or, you know, stuff like that. So, um, uh, so, Propagation of uncertainty is a way of, of aggregating errors, is taking errors in two different values and shoving them together and getting an error in a result, right? So let's just see here. Um, the, uh, so, and what I'm gonna teach you now is a bunch of rules. There's like four or five different rules, right? And there's a way to, um, to teach this using it's a kind of a differential equation thing. It's not hard, but the book that we chose uses these rules, and so we're going to go with the rules. And I guess they're easier, but um, I, I kind of like the the general form. But whatever. So we're going to do we're going to do rules based uh, error uncertainty propagation. Okay? So there there's different rules for addition and subtraction. You know, there's, there's a different rule for addition and subtraction than there is for multiplication and division. You know, and then mixed operations, I don't even think they should say that here because it's, uh, <laughs> you can, you can, uh, you can, if you have like A plus B over C plus D, then you can apply the operation at the top, apply the operation at the bottom, and then apply the, the um, the uh, quotient, you know, at the end. So, but anyways, so the addition of subtra subtraction is that the error in the number is equal to the sum of the squared errors, or so the root sum square of the errors. Right? This is like the Pythagorean theorem here. So it's like um, uh, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So what this does is it assumes that the errors are independent. They're, they're, they lie in an orthogonal plane, you know? 
And any change in A does not change B, right? So that, that's actually important, but you know, down the line. So uh, if you're adding up independent errors, then, they're, then they add as the root sum square. So you may ask yourself, why the root sum square? What the heck is that? Well, the reason is that the root sum square favors the larger value, right? And the reason is that um, if you just add the errors, it's like assuming that the errors are all, say, positive, right? You got positive one and positive one equals positive two, right? But what the error is, it's, a, it's actually an uncertainty interval, right? It's, it's, a, it's a value within which the answer is unknown and can fluctuate, right? So the fluctuation can be positive or negative, right? So it's possible that the error in one could be plus one unit and the error in two could be minus one unit and the error in the result would be zero. But we never actually know that, you know, because these are errors. So, well, I hate it when they do that. But, but so what we do is we add them as orthogonal vectors. We add them as a squared plus b squared. Take the square root of that, and then that will be c, right? For the uncertainty in c. Rather. So that's the addition subtraction rule. The multiplication division rule is that the relative errors sum into the relative error in the final result, right? So the relative error is the percent error in E1, it's the percent error in E2, it's the percent error in E5, right? So you can use percents or you can use the absolute relative error, that's totally fine either way. But, um, but let's see. Oh, nobody can see my screen? What? Ah! Shit, I gotta reshare. Ah, I lost my share. It's back, right? I am so sorry. Anyway, hopefully my words were so enlightening. <laughs> so um, that's where we were. You guys can see it, right? Good, good, good. Excellent. Okay. So now, um, so this is how uncertainties add up, right? 0 0.03, 0 0.02, 0 0.02, right? So uh, if you're adding these and subtracting this value, these are, you know, um, It could be like, think of it as money, right? You, know, you got these hustlers that go around the streets and they collect money and you don't know exactly how much they have, but you know within this range, right? So the uncertainty in the final answer here is not just gonna be three plus two plus two. You know? It's because these can be positive or negative. The uncertainty in the final answer is gonna be about 0.04, right? So it's just gonna be slightly larger than the largest of the so um, that is how that works. And um, now let's see here if we can. Uh, so, uh, for example, if the um, you could a real common example of this is a burette, right? where you read the top, you read the bottom, take the difference, and then. Uh, then the difference has a certain uncertainty, right? So um, uh, here you can take 17.88, 88, subtract 0 0.05, and then that will have a certain uncertainty associated with it, right? Now, what is this red E value here, right? Well, that red E value is, oh shit, is, um, uh, 0.02 squared plus 0.02 squared, which is 0.03, you know, 0.028. But, you know, since we're rounding it, we're going to call it 0.03, right? Yay! EFD, right? 
So what if they were both 0.03? Well, let's just something weird now. Let's say, well, what if they were 0.03, both 0.03? Well, I don't know. Oh, come on, you stupid thing. Stupid non-focusing, auto-focusing thing. There we go. Cool. So if you had, you know, 17.88 plus minus 0.03, and 0.05, and the answer would be 17.83 plus or minus what, right? So um, this value here comes from these two values here. <clears throat> and uh, this, we'll call this E3, right? E3 is going to equal the root sum square of 0 0.03 squared plus 0 0.03 squared. <clears throat> which is going to equal 0 0.042, right? <clears throat> so basically, we're going to drop this uh, last digit here for the person present case. And we're going to say that the answer is 17.83 plus or minus 0.04. So if we need to use this volume, this will have units of milliliters, right? Uh, this volume here, um, is our is our final answer, and it can be used in other things because we have a legitimate error interval on it. So seventeen point eighty three plus minus four mLs. All righty, <clears throat> okay, everybody. So I promise to put onto Canvas um, today sometime. The actual date for the midterm, I think it's going to be in two weeks. And um, so there'll be no more uncertainty on that. And thank you so much for your attention. And are there any other questions for me right now? Any other questions for me now? No? Yes? Other questions? Like, why don't you shut up and go away? Just kidding. What chapters are, are going to be on the quiz? Probably one, two, and three. Probably. <clears throat> Maybe some of four. That's a very good question. And I will clarify, I'll try to clarify that today. I'll definitely get the date today. I don't know if I'll get the exact contents today. Yes, it will be very similar to sapling homework. Yes. <clears throat> this is kind of keeping me on the straight and narrow with you guys. You know? Um. Uh, you are very, very welcome. You're very, very welcome. Thank you. And bye-bye. And uh, I will um, think about the private question. Bye, Professor. Hi. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.